you don't know how special it is to come back here and see all of you here. I mean, I was an undergraduate here, and the idea that I would be right here with the president sitting right there, <laughs> I mean, it just is beyond expectation, and the dean is here, and everybody else. Um, but what makes it incredibly special and uh, part of what made it possible for me to be here this particular week is I also am here for Parents Weekend because my daughter Hattie is a freshman this year at Stanford. Um, the, uh, you know, it gives a chance to reflect a little bit, and I think it's special to get the chance to do it as part of a, a cancer science lecture, because I want to think about some of these problems in the context of what science is telling us about uh, medicine and, and what we do to treat people. Um, and part of the way I start the book is by pointing out that I learned about a lot of things in medical school, but oddly enough, mortality was not one of them. We were interested, I was drawn to medicine because of the desire to fix, to be able to um, especially go into a field like surgery where the idea is, you know, I'm going to take you into an operating room and you're going to come out and you're going to be all better. <laughs> and that chance to be able to say that to people is part of the power that I hoped to be able to have. And so the idea that we were going to contemplate and to have, have to learn about um, you know, what to do to help people tending to problems that you couldn't fix. That just didn't seem like it was that interesting or what we were really there to do. And then I got into practice and found I had a large percentage of my patients who had problems I was not going to make better. Chronic illness, frailty, terminal illness. And I became a cancer surgeon. Now, Cancer surgery, in particular my area of cancer surgery, endocrine surgery, is a field where I, I get to cure most of the patients who come to me. They don't come to me if they're not in that curable state. And yet even then I still had um, many experiences along the way with having to have um, situations which I didn't feel terribly competent to handle. And so the, um, the focus and the interest in the, I'll fix this a little bit so it's not rubbing, um, the focus and the interest of uh, trying to explore these questions were really um, each of my writings for The New Yorker and books along the way have come out of a desire to just puzzle over the areas where I really felt confused, often incompetent, or um, I didn't have clarity about how to move forward. And uh, my first book, Complications, came during training where I was interested in puzzles of how do we, how do we deal with the fact that, that I was only going to learn by making mistakes? And how do we deal with the imperfections of medicine, and how do we understand, how do we even give permission for people to be imperfect, and how do we negotiate that? Um, it was like this curriculum that, I, that, that was another part of medicine I didn't feel like I'd learned along the way. Well, this one came out of situations that I can probably best describe by just telling one of the stories that I tell in the book, um, because it brought the same issues that come up again and again. This, though, was not um, a patient of mine. It was a phone call that came from the husband of my daughter's piano teacher, not Hattie, but her younger sister's piano teacher. Um, her younger sister, Hunter, was just 13 at the time. And um, the husband of Peg Batchelder, who lived in the neighborhood not far from where we lived, was calling to say that Peg was in the hospital, maybe not unlike Alex, um, his family calling you, Gil. And the, um, I'd known a few things about Peg to know that it could be serious. Her, she'd been diagnosed with cancer. She had a pelvic rhabdomyosarcoma um, that had been diagnosed after two years of kind of diagnostic odyssey where, they, where she'd been complaining of hip pain and it was a, quite a delayed diagnosis so it was quite advanced when she was finally picked up. And at that point, she needed a radical hemipelvectomy, removal of one-third of the pelvis, reconstruction with metal, radiation treatments, then chemotherapy, and then months of complications because the uh, hardware became infected and had to be removed and put back in. And she called it her year in hell. And uh, here is, whoops, I thought, let's try that again. Maybe. a way 
related to. All right, we'll see if we can navigate to get the slides back up again. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Thanks. I'll use this button. <laughs> so this is Peg. Just so you have a person to know. She was um, 62 when the um, when I got the call. She'd been back at teaching for about three years. She um, had managed to, uh, you know, she had to give up her teaching and then opened her roster again to having students and filled in no time. She was an avid bicyclist and that had gone by the wayside, but she still remained an avid uh, yoga um, uh, practitioner. She walked with uh, Canadian crutches, those kinds that wrap around your wrists as you walk along. Um, and then otherwise had kind of, you know, re-entered full life and, and uh, was, was um, feeling like those days were behind her. Um, she had an excellent prognosis and then what happened was <clears throat> she had a complication from her chemotherapy. She developed myelodysplastic syndrome, which is a uh, leukemia-like malignancy caused by certain kinds of chemotherapy. It dropped her blood counts, made her prone to infection. She developed fevers. They began starting her on now a new form of chemotherapy, and she insisted that she was going to keep right on teaching through it. She did not want to go through what she had kind of gone through before. And then um, she continued to have some troubles, and uh, in particular fevers that just wouldn't go away. They did a scan looking for whether there was signs of infection, and they found that the original cancer, the rhabdomyosarcoma, had come back. It was now in another section of her pelvis and had spread through her liver. They um, started her on now treatment for that as well, but then began developing side effects from those problems. The cancer progressed. She developed pain. She um, had so much hip pain she became um, unable to move out of her bed and developed incontinence, and that was when she checked into the hospital. She'd been there a couple weeks now. And that was when I got the call. She was, um, she was still having fevers. She was in pain. She was still having trouble with incontinence. And what she wanted to know was, what should she do? What should she do? I said, well, what do the doctors say they should do? <laughs> and she said, well, not much. They were giving her uh, transfusions to keep her blood counts up, pain medications, and um, steroids to combat the tumor fevers. There was a debate among the team about whether she should even be offered a, a bone marrow transplant and high dose therapy as an experimental approach. And then another group who were saying, look, you know, you should consider hospice, or as she put it, you should give up. And my puzzle was. I knew that those didn't feel like the options that were the only ones open to us. You know, do anything, anything aggressive, experimental, no matter what, or just give up. But I didn't know how to navigate these conversations. I mean, I think this was, yet again, this kind of, you know, you have these people come to you as family members, as friends, as patients, and if I could know I could take someone to the operating room to do something that I felt really competent about, but not this situation. And out of many of these conversations, and then the fact that I was beginning to have my father who had developed a malignant astrocytoma in his brain stem and spinal cord, began becoming interested in understanding what, what could we do better. And it struck me over time as I began investigating these topics that we are at a very special moment in a way. 1950, the majority of Americans died in their home. They didn't turn to medicine because medicine didn't have that much really to offer. They didn't think there was a particular reason to go to the hospital. By over the next half century, we discovered a tremendous, amazing panoply of capabilities that have allowed us to offer therapy for virtually every kind of situation. So that by 19 90, it was 83% of us dying in institutions, hospital number one, a nursing home number two. And 
the um, remaining 17%, most of them probably would have ended up in the hospital if it wasn't a sudden death or they could have gotten there or they weren't so isolated that they never got there in the first place. So the, um, we've been through this interesting experiment where we've largely medicalized mortality. We've turned it into um, a problem where it's doctors that you turn to to cope with these particular, that, that phase of your life where you begin needing help, become frail, develop terminal illnesses, and we're supposed to know how to handle this. Well, I didn't particularly well, so what I did is I used what I could from picking up my journalism pen. <laughs> and I could do what many doctors don't get to do, which is I could just go interview people. So I interviewed over 200, as it turned out, I didn't know I'd be ending up doing it, but it ended up 200 plus patients and family members about how they experienced aging and frailty and uh, serious illness, and then also scores of experts, palliative care specialists, hospice nurses, nursing home aides, psychologists, reformers, contrarians, antagonists, <laughs> to understand a little bit about where good answers could come from. What what were the really what were the outliers doing? What were people who are doing really great doing? What were people who weren't doing so great doing? Could we understand what this might mean? And I, one of the things was I found a, a good answer was tied to you know, an interesting set of work for me um, that originated here at Stanford with Laura Carstensen, who is a Stanford professor of psychology. And she did what for me was a landmark series of studies, tracking and studying the emotional lives of people as they age. Um, she did a beeper study where she took people ages 18 to 94 and tracked them over years of, her life, of their lives, every few years checking back in on them. I think your study has been underway now a couple decades. And um, at, you, know, you probably use text messages now, but I'm sticking with the beeper story. <laughs> and so you know, they page them out of the blue, her team, would page people in this study, tracking them over the course of time, and they would then just ask them, you know, seemingly innocuous questions like, what do you feel like now? What emotions are you experiencing at this moment? And you would choose from, you know, a range of options, and it would, you know, include happiness and anger and sadness and all, all different kinds of things. She would also, you know, tap into them to do trade-off studies, saying, you know, okay, suddenly you only have, you have half an hour you could spend with anybody who you want. Do, would you, and, the, and give you an option, give you a deck of cards with options ranging from you get to spend time with your sister to you get to spend time with um, you know, a favorite uh, actor in a movie that you love. And, um, and one of the things that emerged from these studies is that as people age, their desires change and their emotions change. Um, the, Desires change from people being very focused on, um, on accomplishment, on getting, having, achieving, from building networks that allow them to have those achievements in the world, to later in life being focused instead of on building big networks of people that will be connections for you that might make a difference to instead being interested in a smaller, tighter group of people who you're especially close to and developing deeper, more intimate relationships, that these are the people you want to make a difference for. Become less concerned with recognition and reward and more con concerned with simply being and connecting with the people that matter to you. Emotions changed as well. For instance, people she found at, at an older age became capable of um, emotions like poignancy, that you simply don't experience when you were younger. Um, that is a bittersweet kind of feeling. You could experience positive and negative emotions at the same time. And very interestingly, people on the whole seemed happier. I mean, rates of depression and anxiety became, so, so these were people who were getting unhealthier as they got older, more disabled, but they were happier lower rates of depression, lower rates of anxiety. The 75-year-old 
was in a different place than the 45-year-old. The 45-year-old could not imagine it, that when they get to that 75-year-old person, that they would experience and see the world in this way. Somebody should let Zeke Emanuel know. Um, <laughs> but at 75, that group of people were doing better than the other folks. Unless, by the way, they're institutionalized. Unless they're institutionalized and their autonomy and freedom starts to be taken away. Well, one of the things that interested me was, you know, why did it take so long? <laughs> why did it take so long to figure out this kind of wisdom? We call that wisdom. Why, why does that take time? And you can imagine what different theories could be, that it might take time and experience. You need practice in order to um, begin to look at the world that way. Or that um, another group of people thought that maybe it's structural changes in the brain and people doing PET MRIs to understand, you know, maybe your brain needs to develop certain capacities in order to experience poignancy and things like that. But um, she showed it was wrong. And the reason all of that was wrong was partly because in her study doing it here in Northern California, at a time that the AIDS epidemic happened, there was a group of people who were um, developing terminal illness in her population, that the treatments were not fully developed at that time in the same way. And as she particularly, particularly paid attention to that population, found that this was a group of folks who were young, but developed the older profile. And then one of her colleagues that she collaborated with did studies in Hong Kong and found that during the SARS epidemic, or in another study that they did after 9-11, you could see entire populations shift to the older profile. Now, what do I mean? What I mean is that you could see people who suddenly shifted from, you know, those time trade-off studies, they would, they would ask people, who do you want to spend time with? And young people, you know, did not want to spend time with their sister or with their mother. <laughs> they were, they want to spend time with the movie star. <laughs> or, you know, they would love to go to a really loud, dark bar with pounding music at 2 a.m., all in the hope that, you know, shouting to people, you might meet somebody you've never met before. <laughs> and then, as you got older, you didn't care about that so much. <laughs> but 9-11 happens, and people did not want to suddenly be at that bar at 2 a.m. They wanted to be near the people they were closest to. And the observation that she and others began coming to was that as life has its moment of fragility and uncertainty about your future, people, their desires shift radically and very quickly in ways that they don't anticipate that these things can happen. Um, and I think what the lesson that came out of it for me was that this was a group of people who nonetheless felt um, whole and like these were really meaningful experiences for them. And three months after 9-11, people were back to being, you know, they were back to the bar and they're like, I don't want to hang out with my mom and, you know, <laughs> we're back to seeing a long future ahead of us. In fact, I think some of our data was showing that, you know, if you think you have 20 years ahead of you, you basically act as if you're immortal, like it isn't anything that you're worrying about. Well, I think um, there are two, a couple lessons that came out of this. Number one was that well-being is possible even under very severe constraints, that here you were with you know, serious illness like um, HIV that was not um, proving treatable or um, frailty at the extremes of age. And that you, um, that you nonetheless could have real well-being. That well-being was more than just health and, and safety along the way. And that, that second um, thing is that we've had a dramatic trajectory in the course of the last century, and that is that we have um, created through the kinds of discoveries we've made longer life, for sure, improved quality of life along the way. But more than that, we've changed the whole trajectory itself. We went from a period where there was, in the 19th century and before, basically no clear relation between your age and your risk of dying. You could be two years old, you could be 20 years old, you could be 50 years old, and you had high risk that, you know, a, a palpable risk 
that people understood in their lives that life may be short. And now we get to live so that you can get to age 70 without ever really fearing and feeling that in your day-to-day -day life. And that's an incredible gift, but it also led us to lose sight of the fact that well-being was possible outside of the context of necessarily being um, uh, you know, perfectly healthy. And that has had significant consequences. In a life where fragility was ever present, when every day was a little bit of a 9-11 for you, it meant that there, were, there was awareness that there were priorities beyond health. A book that really um, kind of blew me away was by a psychologist when psychology was just coming into being. He was in William James's department at, at, at Harvard at the turn of the 19th century, and he wrote a book that ultimately was published in 1908. His name is Josiah Royce, and the book was the philosophy of loyalty. And what he was puzzling over is he wanted to know why being safe and healthy and well-fed and comfortable felt insufficient to people in their lives. And what he believed was, what he concluded was that um, there is an intrinsic human need to live for something beyond yourself that there's more that you care about than just your own individual survival in the world. Now, there was a whole school of economics that said that was not the way we think. We think that there's a fundamental self-interest, that everybody, you scratch them underneath the surface, and yeah, it's really all about me, <laughs> and that nothing else matters. But the book is really a series of different kinds of thought experiments and, and ways of unpacking this idea that, that pulls it apart and suggests that the individualist just me self-interest view is probably wrong. For example, one puzzle he asks is, why do we care about what happens to the world after we die? If you ask, for example, um, imagine that you die, and then an hour after you die, the entire world blows up with everybody you know in it and disappears. Does that matter to you? Why would it matter to you? If, you're, if your life is all that matters, why, why would it matter? But for the vast majority of people, it matters a lot. They feel like their life would have lost its meaning. What, what, what was I alive for in the first place? And I became persuaded that, in fact, you know, what he called loyalties, your desires, your interests, in looking for something beyond yourself are important. The loyalties to him could be almost anything. It could be loyalty to your family. You'd sacrifice yourself for your family. Loyalty to your country. Loyalty to certain ideals. To beauty. To God. But that there is some way in which that is a fundamental goal that, that when push comes to shove, you live for, you're willing to sacrifice for, that you, are, you have these priorities that go beyond just your own health and survival. Well, today we get to live mostly as if we're immortal, and therefore, having lost sight of those ideas, I think we tend to see the good life as a life of health and independence, that that is what we hold up as the ideal, our health and independence, and that doesn't fit very well with a world where we have a significant part of our lives spent aging and coping with the disabilities of being frail, sometimes not being able to take care of parts of your life, or dealing with serious illness. Now, you know, people in medicine do not say, you know, I want to blog people within every inch of their life all the way to the very end. <laughs> we do not say that that is what our aim is, and that's certainly not what I believed I wanted to do as a surgeon, and yet I found myself in that same situation, offering solutions, delivering them, and then seeing that they weren't solutions at all seemed to make matters worse. And what I think it comes from is out of this belief that if I do anything in medicine, if I'm here in medicine to do anything, it is to help people be healthy and to provide health to people. 
maybe I'm not here to just improve survival, but at least I think my, that health is surely my number one priority, people's health. But what comes out of this is the idea that, in fact, people have priorities besides their health and living longer. That our ideas of well-being are bigger than that. And we've had a very narrow view of what being a human being is in medicine and failed to recognize that people have these priorities. Now, you get to have those priorities and live by them any way you want as long as you're independent. But, we, we, um, but as people become dependent and as they lose some part of their health, I think we in medicine end up kind of lost. You know, we've built housing and elder care for people um, around a set of values that are um, really embedded in medical values. We want to keep you healthy and safe in your nursing home or in your assisted living facility. But the result is we now have old age homes where you can't have alcohol, can't have a drink. You know, that's a choice you get to make in your own home, but not in these places. Or, you know, I've, I visited some of these places and you'd see an 85-year-old with Alzheimer's disease hoarding cookies and hiding them because they have a medically prescribed order that they can only eat pureed food. Like, let them have the damn cookie. <laughs> You know, see these pioneers building new nursing homes where it's built not around the nursing station, but around a kitchen. And in the kitchen, there's a refrigerator. And you can go to the refrigerator and get out what you want. I mean, that is so radical. Like, there are knockdown, drag out fights with the regulators who, ab around whether that should be permissible or not, because a diabetic might go into that refrigerator and pull out a soda. And that's just the smallest level. You know, do you stay connected with your friends? Do you get to go to the church you want? You know, are we going to help with transportation? You can go to a movie on Thursday night if you feel like it. And many of these pioneering places I visited are for low-income settings because it doesn't necessarily cost more. In fact, many of the trade-offs we're describing are ones that are really much more about the culture of what we're trying to do because as one of the nursing home people told me, you know, we sell to the kids. The kids make most of the decisions. And the kids want safety above all. Safety is what we want for those we love. Autonomy is what we want for ourselves. You see the same dynamic play out, that invisibility of the priorities besides survival in the hospital. And I could see it with, with Peg. And what I'd learned by the time that phone call came in was that um, we all have no imagination that for someone with cancer in her situation that had advanced, that was no longer responding to the treatments, conventional treatments that we had available, we had no imagination that a life worth living might be possible for her. She's in bed. She's in pain. She is incontinent. She's not been able to leave. I think many people um, in that situation offered an option of assisted death. I choose that. And I am one person who has these complicated views about this. I believe that there are people who have unbearable suffering that, is, that it would be um, cruel and, and um, heartless not to offer an option that they could end their life um, under the face of such unbearable suffering if it's, you know, when it's unavoidable. But I also think that the goal is not a good death. And a lot of our debate about the end of life has been about the idea of a good death. But it really is about, I think, the question of having as good a life as possible all the way to the very end. And being able to capture that idea and make it real for people. And I fear the discussion around assisted death because it is often not about that question of what you can make possible. It often, I think, comes out of a failure to imagine that for someone like Peg, lying in bed, that a good life could be possible in the remaining time that she has. Now, one of the things I did is I asked experts who, some of whom were really good at handling the situations, I, I would um, ask them about what they came to understand. I think the key lesson was that people have priorities besides just living longer. 
and those are their loyalties. You know, what is important to them in their life, what they're willing to even sacrifice their life for. And that the key, it's a, th this set of research has been done, it's a very technical procedure, but in order to learn what people's priorities are, you have to ask them. <laughs> and we don't ask. We ask less than a third of the time before people die what their priorities are as they, their health fades or their, they come to the face short in time. And I began asking people, you know, what should be my checklist for, if I'm going to do something differently in my life, what should that be next week? And on the checklist they said, you know, number one, you should stop talking so much. <laughs> The key was to elicit what people's priorities are. And I thought my job was tell people the facts. Here are the pros, here are the cons of your, here are your options, option A, option A, B, option C. Here are the pros, the cons, the risks, the benefits. Here's your prognosis and your risk situation. And you know, so now what do you want to do? They, 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 one palliative care doctor said, I'm an explainaholic when what I needed to do was ask questions so that I'm talking less than 50% of the time. And I went into my clinic visits after that conversation. I was like, holy cow, they're right. I'm talking 90% of the time in my office visit. And that meant I needed the words to understand what do I ask that helps people process their prognosis, process what they're going through. And I, they helped me understand you ask questions like, you know, what are, what's your understanding of where you are with your condition at this time? What are your goals and priorities if your health worsens? What are your fears and worries for the future? What do you, what outcomes are unacceptable to you? Does your family know the answer to these questions? So I'm on the phone with Peg. She's put it on a speakerphone in her hospital room. And I asked those questions. So I ask, what's your understanding of where you are with your cancer? And she said, flat out, I'm going to die. And she was angry. She sounded pissed. <laughs> She's like, there's nothing more that they can do. Her husband later said, that was the first time he'd heard her articulate that. And she put it in words. I asked her the next question, what are your goals then? And she said, ah, I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't have any that I see are possible. The palliative care doctors, they didn't tell me what to do about this situation. <laughs> <laughs> so I just kept on with the question. I said, well, then what, what are your fears for the future? Fears and worries. And then she gave me a litany. She said that she feared facing more pain. She feared suffering the humiliation of losing more of her bodily control. She feared dying in the hospital. She'd been there for days already, just getting worse and worse. Now, on my travels and in my interviews, I had spent a few days with a hospice team in particular a hospice nurse named Sarah Creed who showed me around and as I was watching what she did I was really sort of struck by the fact that she didn't do any you know my image of hospice was it was a black hooded nurse with a IV drip of morphine <laughs> like that was that didn't seem to be what she was doing <laughs> you know and I thought maybe well maybe they just let nature take its course and kind of make you comfortable that's what we always say we, we, we can keep you comfortable that's what they said to Peg do you want the therapy or do you want to be kept comfortable? And uh, that didn't sound like a good plan. And that wasn't what Sarah Creed was doing at all. She was like treating people and doing stuff, helping with breathing and lining up oxygen and doing all these things. I'm like, what are you doing? And she said, you got to understand, in medicine, your goal, doctor guy, <laughs> your goal is to sacrifice people's time and quality of life now for the sake of possible time later. But at a certain point, that's not such a good trade-off. It's not working out. And then she comes in and her goal 
is to use medical capability to give you the best possible day today, regardless of what it means for the future. Now, ironically, out of the research studies that have been done, that does not lead people to die sooner. There have been a number of hospice studies now that have shown that people in these circumstances end up living longer, whether it's congestive heart failure, pancreatic cancer, breast cancer, it's either equal time or longer. And then a really with the best done study out of the Mass General was with stage four lung cancer patients who were enrolled in a trial, just like a drug trial, only in the trial instead of a treatment and a, and a control treatment. The treatment in this case was the controls got usual oncology care and the treatment arm got the usual oncology care plus they had early palliative care conversations, early palliative care visits to talk about the needs and goals and concerns that you might have as your health worsens. And the group who got those early palliative care consultations around these kinds of discussions ended up stopping being less likely to choose a third, third or fourth line chemotherapy. They stopped chemotherapy earlier. They had 30% less oncology costs. They spent fewer days in the hospital, less likely to die in the hospital or the ICU. They started hospice sooner. They had less suffering at the end of life. And here was the kicker. They lived 25% longer. It just meant we were not making good decisions then. I mean, if this was, if this was an oncology drug, I mean, the FDA would approve you, palliative care docs here in the room. <laughs> so I said to her, I met this hospice nurse, and what she explained to me was that her aim is not giving up. Her aim was to make the best day possible for you under the circumstances. It seemed like it had been a while since you'd had a good day. And she said, yes. Yes, it has. I said, so is that worth hoping for? Is that worth fighting for with our medical capabilities? Just one good day. 48 hours later, she left the hospital with hospice. Her husband talked with her about it, and they chose hospice. I had to break the news to Hunter, 13 years old, that she would not be having piano lessons with Peg anymore, that Peg was dying. We debated, do we tell her that her piano teacher's dying? And we said, yes, we're going to have to. Pe um, Hunter was struck really low. She wanted to know if she could see her, and I said, it's likely you're not going to be able to see her again. And then a few days later, we got a surprising call. It was from Peg, and she wanted to know if Kathleen, my wife, and I would let her, and Hunter was willing, she would want to know if she could start teaching Hunter again. She said, I didn't know, I don't know how much time I have left, but, but I'd like to resume teaching again with the time that I've got. And that was more than she or I had ever imagined when she was lying there in that bed. But I met, ultimately, her hospice nurse, a woman named Deborah French, who came to her house the day she came home and talked with her about what really mattered to her, what she cared about most in her life. And then she said she would work to make it happen. The first goal was just managing the daily difficulties. And so they got a, a bed down on the first floor, and they, um, a hospital bed you know, put in the first floor. They, arranged a bedside commode. They arranged a way for her to dress and to clean and to kind of manage just the basics. They also worked a lot on pain control. It gave her much higher doses of morphine than they were giving her in the hospital. Gave her another drug called gabapentin and then gave her Ritalin to combat the stupor that came from the pain medications. And with that, her anxieties just plunged as those challenges came under control. Her husband Martin said later to me that she was focused on the main chance. She came to a clear view of how she wanted to live the rest of her days. She was going to be home, and she was going to teach. Now, that took a lot of planning and medical expertise to make it possible to happen. 
for a lesson to occur, you had to really calibrate the meds, for example. You wanted to give enough pain medication that they would uh, be working during the lesson, but not so much that she would be groggy and slurring her speech and freaking the kids out. But they did. It worked. Martin said that she was more alive running up to a lesson and for the days after than he'd seen her in weeks. She'd had no children. Her students filled that place for her. And so she still had some things she wanted them to know before she did. She wanted to say her goodbyes, give her parting advice. And I think medicine and society has forgotten how vital those matters are to people as they approach life's end. People want to share memories. They want to pass on wisdoms and keepsakes, keepsakes, connect with loved ones, make some last contributions to the world. And that role, some observers argue, are among life's most important, that they are part of the way that people give meaning to their life. And the way we in medicine, the way that I, among them, denied people those moments out of obtuseness and ignorance, I think is cause for our shame. Peg got to fulfill her final role. She lived a six full weeks on hospice. Hunter got to have lessons for four of them. And then there were two final concerts. One was a concert with Peg's former students who flew in from all over the country to play for her. And then another was a recital with her current students ranging from elementary school age to high school. They gathered in her living room and they played Brahms and Dvorak and Chopin and Beethoven for their adored teacher. And this is her at my daughter's, at the last recital a few weeks before. And after the last person had played, Peg then went off to another side of the room and asked each child to come up individually to see her. And she had a few words individually for them and a gift that she wanted to give them. And she gave Hunter a book of music that she had picked out for her that she wanted her to learn and master. And then she um, put her arm around her shoulder and gave her one more gift. You're special, she whispered. And it was something she never wanted those kids. We've had a 50-year experiment with medicalizing mortality, of treating it as just another problem that we would treat, that we would solve. And that's failed. But it doesn't have to. It doesn't mean losing all of our capabilities. It means asking what we're fighting for along the way. And once you realize we're not asking people about their priorities, you realize it's not just about the end of life. It extends all the way to that moment when we start needing help along the way. Now, the, there's a untold story in the book that I want to append, append here, a, an unt a story that's not told in the book, which is, OK, so what do we do about this? And for a medical center, thinking long and hard about how we make these things work, I just want to add a few words about how we think about scaling up the lessons that we're seeing here I'm not an expert in palliative care. I'm not an expert in any of these notions. I was simply a person who wanted to do better at what I was doing in my practice and learn how to use these capabilities. And the, and the book is in many ways my trial and error description along the way of using what I learned and sometimes it backfired and sometimes it didn't, but it made a huge difference in the care of my father as he progressed with his uh, brain tumor ultimately to quadriplegia and then finally dying, but dying at home and dying doing many of the things that he cared about most. But along the side, I run a research center, which um, Gil mentioned as the other part of my life. And it's running a research center that's focused on how we scale solutions that drive better care at critical moments in people's lives everywhere. Uh, you know, my partner in crime across coasts is Artie Milstein here at Stanford, who is doing very, very similar work where, you know, better health means higher quality, lower cost, and genuinely better outcomes along the way. And we've recruited a team with, I think, world caliber expertise in data and software engineering and large scale program management and really working on the science of scaling up healthcare improvement. And, 
in, in big experiments involving big populations. And it's ranged from our work with the surgery checklist, which I wrote about in my previous book, to reduce mortality in surgery, and has extended to childbirth trials that we now have underway. And we've gradually happened in thinking about critical moments in people's lives as how you enter the world, childbirth, high risk, high failure, high cost. Mm -hmm. Surgery, half of hospital spending is around invasive procedures and it's high risk, high failure again. And then how you leave this world with the end of life with the latest group that we have um, added in along the way now about two and a half, three years ago. Um, our approach has been to try to teach at the Dana-Farber in a trial what we've now called our conversation guide, seven questions that I mentioned to you earlier from what is, you know, asking doctors to try to learn how to have these conversations, not in terms of just explaining the facts, but eliciting the answers to these kinds of questions like, what are your biggest fears and worries about the future with their health? The trial is, you know, a classic trial. It's trying to do this in a properly rigorous way, a cluster randomized trial of a QI intervention, quality improvement intervention at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, where our outcome is we want to see whether goals of care discussions, these kinds of conversations, can occur more earlier and better. And better means that the seriously ill patients receive less unwanted care as they near the end of life and are at more peace with their circumstances as they, as they come to the end. We've had 93 clinicians randomized to the intervention, either intervention or usual care, meaning that they were taught in a two and a half hour training program around using, in practice, using this kind of approach. We had worked with them to identify their patients in the last year of life and trigger, with triggers like asking them, would you be surprised if this person were to die in the next year? And if you wouldn't be surprised, are you having this conversation? And when they tell us that they wouldn't be surprised, we also notify that the patients, we send a mailing to the patient that your doctor may have this conversation with you and send the questions that they may ask them. What I can tell you is that the early data is in. We're about a year into the trial. We have another year, a little over a year to go. We have 400 patients enrolled. About 140 have died so far. And what we've seen is the conversations are feasible. They are happening and rolling out. They don't appear to be harmful. We've been very aware that we could be charged with a death panel. And one thing that we're seeing, we've been tracking anxiety and depression levels in the patients in the, in the intervention arm versus the control arm. And we're seeing no increase in depression. And not only no increase in anxiety, but people in palliative care will tell you to no surprise, anxiety levels fall significantly in the folks who have the, the clinicians trained in these capabilities. We're seeing about double the likelihood that the clinicians in the trained group are having these conversations and they're happening earlier. But that's, I warn you, preliminary data, that primary data will still be another year to come. But we're tackling this question of saying, how do you scale up this work? And the answer can't be that everybody has a geriatrician and a palliative care doctor in their life. There aren't enough to go around. <laughs> And so it has to be how every one of us, cancer clinicians like myself and many of you who are here, also in other fields, primary care, cardiology, nephrology, that we add these capabilities to our armamentarium and that we become effective. And part of it is by saying that we will invest a team of folks, and that's what basically what we did in this trial. We said, we're going to ask our palliative care doctors to own not only the success of the patients who are consulted to see them, but that we're going to pay for them to look after all seriously ill pop people in our population, sample how often we're failing to have these conversations, which is about 70% of the time, and that they will work with their colleagues to drive those numbers up and make it better. And whether it's this approach or others, that kind of population management approach rolling out, that is where we have to be able to go. We have to make systems where it becomes normal to have these conversations, and more importantly, where the seriously ill patient can say about their clinician, they know what my priorities in life are in addition to living longer, and they respect them. 
So I'm delighted to be here simply to have the chance to tell you about some of this work, even more to get to have the panel afterwards where we can talk about some of what's required to make these things happen at large scale with an extraordinary group of people that I feel really lucky who've been thinking about it from every range and approach and point of view. I'm also really grateful because I know Stanford is a place that is trying to make this happen in everybody's care while also providing every advanced technological capability that we have at our disposal, just knowing all the while what we're really fighting for along the way. Thank you for welcoming me back home. <laughs>